This is the Agoro Carbon Farming Podcast. Agoro Carbon Alliance is taking action on a global scale to reverse the effects of climate change by decarbonizing farming and restoring carbon to the world's soil. On this podcast, we're going to explore carbon farming from the soil to the atmosphere and how it affects everyone in between. To learn more, visit us at agorocarbonalliance.com. Welcome to another edition of the Agoro Carbon Farming Podcast. I'm Scott War, and today we're going to focus on biodiversity's role in the ag carbon market. We're going to explore how enhancing biodiversity benefits farmers and ranchers, improves soil health, and supports crop yields. We're going to touch on uh, the global bio- biodiversity framework's impact on conservation efforts and how Agoro Carbon's practices in cropland and pasture land contribute to a diverse and resilient ecosystem. To help us out in this discussion, we have a a fun and interesting expert, Christopher Daly. Chris is an expert in the carbon farming markets with a diverse background that spans program development, methodology design, and trend analysis with a foundation in political science from University of Hartford and advanced studies in environmental and forest management from the University of Aberdeen. Chris has been shaping the voluntary carbon marketplace since uh, 2019, I believe, starting as a program officer at Vera. His journey also includes impactful work as a senior associate at Ecosystem Marketplace, part of the Forest Trends Initiative, where he contributed in vital environmental and economic strategies. Boy, that's a, a mouthful, Chris. Let's let's get this thing started out first. You know, biodiversity. Um, can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. What does biodiversity mean to you? How do you define biodiversity? Hey, folks, thanks a whole lot for the introduction there, Scott. Happy to be here. To start that one off, I have pulled up here the sort of textbook definition of biodiversity and want to read that out and then sort of demystify it and then talk about what it means to me and what it means to the carbon market as a whole. Great. So biodiversity or simply biological diversity as defined by the American Museum of Natural History, great place if you haven't been, (laughs) is the variety of life on Earth at all of its levels, from genes to ecosystems. It can encompass the evolutionary, ecological, and cultural processes that sustain life. That's a mouthful. So what does that mean for folks listening in, and what does that mean for folks wanting to understand how this impacts the American farmland? So American farmland and ranch land is teeming with life that is interwoven together in a complex yet pretty strikingly beautiful, delicate web. Biodiversity in American heartland is a series of contrasts. It's fragile yet resilient, abundant but fleeting, microscopic yet knowing no bounds. Biodiversity is top of mind for myself and for other folks here at Agoro, as it's at the very heart of what we all do. So we're talking about the microorganisms in the soil that help with the soil characteristics and the health of the soil. So does biodiversity mean not only the amount, the number of microorganisms, but the amount of different types of microorganisms or does it mean both? It sure does. It means both. So we're looking at abundance as well as richness of biodiversity. Okay. So it could mean what we're finding actually in the soil. When you, when you dig up a piece there, what's, what's, what's there. And what kind of life that it helps sustain. So healthy soils, healthy grassland could translate to increased water availability, could translate to just increased different types of biodiversity in insects, for example. And when you have an an abundance and richness of different types of insects in an area, that will translate to different, uh, a much healthier avian population, much healthier bird populations and healthier road populations. It, it, it really builds out upon itself there. So it's in a long-winded way there, Scott, yes, yes, and yes. It means <laughs> both things there. You know, in the, in the decade that I've been working in uh, agriculture, I've noticed that there has been a shift, or maybe it's just a perception from my end that there's been a shift in looking at agriculture from a health standpoint by looking at the crop the trees, the vegetation or whatever, and looking at the health of what's above the soil. And that's what you were striving for as a, as a, as a farmer. And, and, and really 
that's what you get paid for, right? Is, is, is what comes off of, uh, off of the farm. But I've seen a shift to realizing that the health of the soil is a direct relationship to the health of what's growing out of the soil. And so to pay attention to the, the health of the soil, the biodiversity, the, the, the microorganisms in the soil is, is really advantageous um, for growers. And it's hard because it's not o- always what you see. How, how, how can we measure the biodiversity and how do we measure the health of a soil? It's a great question. I was hoping you'd ask that one. Then, so. <laughs> so you, there's a, there's a few ways there's, let's talk about, um, I mean, I touched upon birds. Yes. Um, so let's, let's start big and go and go small, shall we? Um, you have traditional methods like bird counts. Mm. Okay. Where you have an ornithologist, it could be an ornithologist in training. It could be a grad student or could, I, I do backyard bird counts myself. I went from uh, Portland, Maine and I, and I done bird counts to the Audubon society there. And my dad does them down in Connecticut where that could be just sitting in one spot for a little bit and counting everything that you see. So we had three robins at this hour. We had two Orioles go by. We had a, a red tail hawk and keeping track of that and monitoring that and looking, okay, I did the same survey, what, two years ago. Let's look at if there's any increase or decrease. And if there is an incre- increase or decrease, what could have led to that? And there's loads of literature that could lead to that. So that's some of the the more maybe for me, because I, I don't have a, as much of a, so, a soil health background, not an agronomist. So that's the exciting uh-huh. way of monitoring biodiversity to me. The exciting uh, way of monitoring biodiversity for some of the agronomists that we have and some of the soil science folks out there will be actually digging into the soil and doing a soil health assessment and putting that under a microscope and seeing what types of organisms are there, right? What led to this, the proliferation of those microscopic organisms? Looking at the actual soil itself, smearing it on a piece of paper, how, how, and in, in putting it in between your right. hands, is this retaining more moisture than it did last year? And if so, is that because of uh, a, a, a further abundance in earthworms? Is that a, a different practice changes leading to that? Holistically, how did we get here? So what? Let, let's let's just be real simple. What are the advantages if you follow practices that do improve soil health? What are some of the what are some of the benefits that a a farmer or a rancher can see from improved biodiversity and soil health? Though the discourse surrounding biodiversity now often seems to be dominated by conversations about increasing it, which would mean an increase mm-hmm. in species richness and diversity, it's important to remember that it's not just about increasing biodiversity, but maintaining and conserving ecosystems that are in harmony with one another. There's an already massive and ever-growing body of literature out Mm -hmm. there that's shown time and time again that conserving native ecosystems as well as promoting their proliferation leads to healthier soil, higher yields, and better water management. Most importantly, conserving diverse ecosystems and encouraging the proliferation through responsible stewardship of farmland is also turning heads amongst consumers as we're seeing an increase in labeling surrounding proper land stewardship and land management. Yeah, I think that that's interesting that, um, you know, the consumer is involved in this. Um, you obviously stated what the advantage is to the rancher and the farmer. If they can save water or be more efficient with their water and with their um, their inputs and getting more yield and quality from healthier soils or um, that have higher biodiversity – that makes sense from them from a financial standpoint. Let's talk about the big companies out there um, that have these big um, climate-related uh, targets. Does does biodiversity figure into any of that from a big food product standpoint? It sure does. Increasingly, you're seeing corporates are they're seeking out carbon credits that have additional biodiversity mm. claims attached to them, as well as wanting to ensure their own supply chains are taking into account the health and well-being of diverse ecosystems. Look, the sort of way that corporates went about offsetting in the past was just a one for one, right? We're buying a, a carbon credit that represents one metric ton of CO2, either um, sequestered from the atmosphere or reduced from the baseline scenario. Now we're seeing corporates that are demanding more and that's better for, for everybody, frankly. So we're seeing 
farmers and ranchers implement activities that can serve and promote biodiversity to bolster their land's resiliency in response to this, right? Not just in response to this, but in response to history, because history is a preamble to, to everything. The American heartland is a patchwork of stories about people and land that through hardship and adversity have been resilient and persevered. Let's take a quick history lesson okay. here and why it's important to, to go into this. I, I love chatting about the Dust Bowl. So the Dust Bowl, for example, was one of the most catastrophic ecological disasters in American history. Entire ecosystems collapsed, leaving communities and their associated ecosystems completely ravaged by the, by the elements. Nevertheless, the area that the Dust Bowl occurred in is still farmed today. And we have folks enrolled there to this very day. And we have folks who have had their roots there well since the Dust Bowl. And now it's farmed today with NATO ecosystems compromised of grasslands and wetlands operating in part how they once did centuries, centuries ago, but still having farming happening and ranching happening right next to it. And we see agricultural and ecological interests being met in tandem because of this responsible land stewardship. Now, the Dust Bowl serves as a reminder that protecting biodiversity isn't just a marketing gimmick, but crucial in protecting the way of life for scores of Americans. Farmers know this, and you know who else does? Buyers. Carbon credit buyers are increasingly seeking out credits that have biodiversity co-benefits, specifically credits coming from projects that bolster our climate resilience and bolster climate resilience here on the Okay, so I I think I just learned something new. I'm, I mean, Agoro is involved in in helping farmers and ranchers um, um, procure additional revenue on farm by helping them generate carbon credits. Are you telling me that there's also um, a biodiversity type credit that can be sold? Yeah, there sure is, and they've been doing that for a little while now. Oh, it's interesting. Been constantly evolving and changing. So biodiversity credits and credits that are focused on going beyond just the carbon uh, aspect. So beyond just sequestering carbon or re- reducing carbon from the baseline scenario there have been a part of the voluntary carbon market for a long time and are evolving as we speak. So the first one was something called CCB, which is Climate Community Biodiversity Standard. A lot of <laughs> um, which is a standard seeking to standardize projects delivering tangible climate community biodiversity benefits. Um, and that was launched in 2005, so a little while ago. Another biodiversity-oriented standard, the Sustainable Development Verified Impact Standard, or simply SDVISTA, which Agaro Carbon is util- utilizing now, actually, to quantify non-carbon benefits of our projects, has been around since 2019. Projects with accompanying biodiversity standards have been sought after by these larger corporates for a while now, since 2005, but they've really been ramping up as of late. We're, we're seeing a lot more interest. Now, it seems like uh, that these carbon credits, and now I know about these new biodiversity credits, it doesn't seem like they are in uh, competition with each other. They're actually brother and sister, if you will. I mean, they're hand in hand. If you're doing things to promote um, carbon sequestration, those are the same practices that are going to help biodiversity in the soil. Am I, am I missing something there? Is that, is that correct? No, that's correct. So you, you're out there implementing these new practices, yeah, right? And you're monitoring soil organic carbon. While you're out there, you can also monitor a whole lot of other things. And with a further understanding of what some of our project activities, what they could, what they could bring about, like reduced till, no till, um, cover cropping, et cetera. We're not leaving anything on, on the table here. And we want folks to understand that it's not just emission reductions and removals that are, that's occurring when you implement these practices successfully, but it's a whole ecosystem restoration at times, as well as bolstering that resilience. Interesting. I, I, I know that with the, the carbon credit thing, um, and, and corporations that are, are, are buying these corporate credits, a lot of that some of it is voluntary and some of it is uh, managed through regulation and standards. Is there something similar with this um, biodiversity um, credit, this framework around biodiversity? Are there standards and regulations that are, are helping to uh, expedite the, the, this whole idea of biodiversity credits? 
Yeah, there sure are. And it's not just on in the on the US level, but there've been a lot of international oh, here. Okay. So let's take the global biodiversity framework, for example. I'll throw another acronym at you, GBF. Okay. Uh, is it, is it, are, 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 are we going to get Ashley and the marketing department to put together a legend in the show notes that we can, we can reference with all the acronyms? <laughs> we'll send you some alphabet soup. <laughs> okay. So the GBF is a comprehensive international plan that was adopted at, I believe it was COP15. Yeah, COP15 to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. Aiming for, uh, they had this vision for 2050 of quote unquote, living in harmony with nature. So we've got these ambitious 2030 targets, including protecting 30% of global land and ocean areas. It emphasizes effective implementation, increasing financing, and inclusive participation in biodiversity conservation efforts. So it's pretty all-encompassing. Of It's not just increase biodiversity, but it's conserve it, it's protect it, and it has. it's not just a, a label on a box cereal you're buying, uh, but it's actual target set for different dates here. Mm -hmm. This framework helps incentivize project developers like Agoro, Carbon, policymakers, and corporates alike to take ecological matters into consideration when developing projects. So it's no longer just the the whole emission reductions or removals, but it's we have to take into consideration a whole lot of other stuff, including biodiversity. This framework adds an urgency to the matter of biodiversity loss and seeks to funnel more finance toward projects that address biodiversity loss and conservation. These types of frameworks and initiatives are a clear signal, at least to us, and to the market as a whole, that projects need to start taking biodiversity considerations a lot more seriously, which market trends as well have been showing over some time now. Uh, I've worked on a number of projects where we uh, have been trying to improve soil health. And soil health can be hard to define sometimes and and for sure, hard to measure. There's a lot of different soil health metrics out there that you can send in to, you know, this lab or that lab and get a soil health um, um, measurement. Um, and they're not all the same. There's different different uh, testing methods. Um, what type of method does a Goro use when it's um, trying to measure biodiversity in soils? This question, Todd. So measuring biodiversity in soil involves direct methods like microbial sampling and DNA sequencing. Indirect methods such as analyzing biochemical indicators and physical soil properties and assessing ecosystem functions through tests like decomposition rates. Beyond soil, biodiversity assessment extends to our ecosystem and organisms, including birds, which include important indicators, which are important indicators for ecological health, which I mentioned a bit earlier. Um, our, we have our team of a trained agronomists that go out and will actually work with some of our farmers and ranchers to understand some of this and do some of these tests on the ground right then and there, as well as sending soil pore samples back to a laboratory for further analysis. It sounds like this biodiversity thing is uh, an up and coming um, um, topic in agriculture. Um, it sounds like Agoro is is leading the way by becoming involved in this biodiversity realm. How is Agoro using or contributing to the biodiversity in cropland and pasture land affiliated with all, all their existing programs? How aren't we, Scott? So both of our <laughs> projects, our cropland and our pasture land project, are implementing activities that are shown to increase and conserve biodiversity. So no tillage farming and the use of no. cover crops enhance soil biodiversity by minimizing soil disturbance and providing continuous habitat for soil organisms. Um, you know, these practices also improve soil structure, increase right. organic matter retention. And create a more stable environment for a wide range of soil life, from microorganisms to our larger soil fauna, thereby supporting greater biodiversity. So we have those two practices, which I mentioned a bit earlier. And we also have seeding of native plants and implementing improved grazing in our pastureland projects, which promote biodiversity by restoring plant diversity and improving habitat quality for a wide range of species. So you're getting better forage there, as well as promoting biodiversity. These approaches encourage a pretty balanced ecosystem, I'd say, supporting not only a variety of plant species, but also insects, birds, and other associated wildlife that depend on them, leading to our healthier, and again, I'm going to keep on using this term because it's, it's true, a much more resilient ecosystem. 
Well, it sounds like uh, a Goro from its inception has been working on biodiversity in the soils, but mostly focused on, on the carbon sequestration component because it's a way that farmers could make more money. Um, looking to the future, how do you see this biodiversity uh, thing working out for growers and ranchers? Uh, do you think that that will be a way that they can add to their uh, revenue within their um, farming systems? Look, when masked with the, the question, what do you think will be the future of biodiversity and biodiversity crediting in general? He said Agoro has been at, been doing this since day one, the ground floor, and the future also is the Agoro Carbon Alliance. Oftentimes, when we think about projects that implement activities that promote biodiversity, we think of forestry and forestry adjacent type projects, right? Um, that said, biodiversity is the lived in world around us, not just in forests, mangroves, and coral reefs, but in farmland and ranch and the like. Projects that ensure our food systems not only conserve biodiversity, but also promote the proliferation of, bio, bi- proliferation of biodiversity. That's the future right there, Scott. Excellent. Well, we've we've touched on a lot of things here on biodiversity. Um, is there are there any final thoughts as we're wrapping up here, Chris? Um, what are what excites you about this um, biodiversity? Is there something else that that a listener um, you think should know about this? It's a great question. And what excites me is is looking forward, is looking the future, looking to the future rather. It's the fact that this is such a great way to coalition build here yeah. where we all there's look just turn on the news for a couple minutes and we're kind of a divided nation and a divided uh world right now sometimes it seems yeah but one thing that doesn't we all eat well, at least right. i sure do uh, we all live in the same planet we all enjoy the same grasslands and mountains and, and what have you and it's something that we could all get behind here it's not it's not something just for a select few of individuals. So I think the opportunity to build relationships, coalition build between different types of farmers and ranchers and connect different markets together all through the vein of conserving and promoting the proliferation of biodiversity. That's pretty exciting to me. It is. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. I've learned a lot. If if someone listened to this and they want to learn more about biodiversity or or carbon credits or how a girl can help them add revenue to their farm while improving on their soil health and their their yield and quality, um, where can they go? Where can they learn more? Well, I'll start off by saying if you want to learn more about biodiversity in the uh, American farms and ranches, talk to a farmer or rancher first. And okay. Go out, go out for a drive in the country and, and, and roll down the windows and listen to the, just the amount of songbirds and feel the healthy soil and, and smell the, the life around you. That's one way to do it. Or you don't have to leave your office. You don't have to leave your desk. You don't have to leave your phone. Go to agorocarbonalliance.com to learn more. From there, you can uh, get in contact with one of our agronomists as well will lead you through it a lot more maybe eloquently than I just did. <laughs> I think you did a very good job. I think there's a lot of information at uh, that website, a lot of questions and answers. There's a, uh, a learning hub there that you can learn a lot about um, all of the, the products and services that uh, Agoro offers. And like you said, they have a team of, of agronomists out there that are willing to sit down and talk through this with you and answer questions and see if it's right for you. So uh, that's one of the things I've always admired about Agoro is they're not hard sell. They're saying, Hey, we want to help you become more resilient. I think is the word you said, um, more regenerative, more sustainable, making sure that the farm stays in the family and, and continues to do what it was designed to do for, for many generations. So thank you very much, Chris. It's been nice to meet you and uh, learn more about biodiversity. Thanks for having me. It's been, been, a, been a pleasure today. You've been listening to the Agoro Carbon Farming Podcast, where we bring you knowledge on how to sustainably and profitably transform farming through carbon cropping. To learn more about how you can become a partner, visit us at agorocarbonalliance.com or follow us on our many social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, 
YouTube and LinkedIn.